All right, let me get started. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm David Rowe. I'm the director of Digital Matters. Uh, we are going to be doing a hybrid event, so the people, key people, joining us through Zoom. Uh, Trevor is our graduate fellow for communication. We're going to be doing our workshop today. Comstock, if you mind, don't mind um, talking to the Zoom people, let me know how to interact with us. Yeah. Uh, welcome. Hopefully, um, you can hear us all right. Um, if you have any issues, just put them in the chat. Um, we'll, we'll have this feed going in the room at the same time as Trevor is screen sharing his presentation. So you can put your Zoom view in side-by-side -side mode to see the room and the presentation at the same time if you'd like and just right click and pin the speaker, which will be our little 360 box. And um, Trevor will also open up to questions throughout his presentation. So you can put them in the chat and I will present them to Trevor, or you can unmute yourselves and speak into the room with the rest of us. Um, and that's that's just about it. We'll be posting a recording of this Zoom in a week or two. Um, if anyone uh, misses part of the presentation, you can catch up on the recording. Great, thanks, Tom. Uh, Trevor, without any further ado. Awesome, yeah, uh, like David said, I'm Trevor Smith. I'm a second year master's student in the Department of Communications. Um, I mostly do critical media studies uh, with a focus on digital media and politics. So that's kind of how I ended up on this topic and, uh, and with the subject. So uh, to start off, I, am, I was introduced to the subject of this workshop uh, because of my fellowship here at Digital Matters. Um, and I recently, my project was approved by my committee. So it is going to end up being my master's final project which I plan on finishing yeah, in the next six months or so. Um, so like I mentioned, I do critical media studies and there's been a lot of really, really good um, critical writing about algorithms on the internet that already exist. Um, and I'm sure, you know, if you are tuned into the news or, you know, the topic of algorithms in general, you'll have heard of some, some people who are pretty critical about them. Um, that being said, most of that literature to date exists about the AI that we're most familiar with in digital context, which are the ones that sort, recommend, and moderate media content. I think the ones that probably get discussed the most are the ones that suggest YouTube videos or Facebook posts as an example. And those are really, it's really good writing and really interesting. But for my project, I am focusing on artificial intelligence that creates new media content. Um, so rather than sorting, recommending, or moderating, it's making something entirely new. Um, and I chose it because they're still pretty primitive, these technologies. Um, some of them are shockingly good, and others are, you can tell, it's, it's pretty, um, you can tell a robot made it and not a human, right? And we'll get to that too. Uh, and I'm definitely not a computer scientist, and it's good to have some computer science people here. Uh, so my understanding about you know the actual functionality of them is somewhat limited, but uh, I think functional enough to be able to make critical arguments about them. Um, and that being said, because this is a workshop, I will be introducing more resources than teaching you how to use specific tools. Um, and if you're a creative type, I hope that one of these tools will jump out to you as something you, you can use for brainstorming or in whatever creative endeavors you have. Um, I, I do a little bit of, of music stuff. And so I've had some fun with some of the tools as far as writing music with algorithms and things like that. And I'm still learning a lot. So, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to hear your comments and I wanna make it pretty discussion based. So that's about that. Uh, so I already mentioned this a little bit. We're gonna do a really brief intro into how these generative AI work, uh, including some of the kind of definitional challenges I've run into doing my literature review. Um, I want to do a brief kind of tour of existing generative AI, my favorites, and hopefully you find something that will be useful or interesting to you. And then we're going to have a discussion. I've, I've created some questions, and that is one tool, I guess one method that I can kind of teach how to do is, is critical analysis and textual analysis. So that's what we'll conclude with, and then we'll have questions at the end. So, and I am so glad there's computer science people here because I want to hear their thoughts on this as well. But when I started this project, one thing I struggled with was what does AI mean? What is an algorithm? What is machine learning, deep learning, and how do these things overlap, intersect? What is the difference between them? And 
try as I might, I never found, I'm a very visual learner, and I never found a chart or graph that would explain this kind of to a non-CS person like me. So I, I made one based on my kind of understanding. And there's other definitions of AI. People sometimes think that this definition is too broad, but the, the definition I like from AI is it's a machine that mimics human cognitive function. Uh, so I kind of see that as like the biggest circle in the Venn diagram. Within that is algorithms, which are a set of rules or processes that automatically do a process or attempt to solve a problem. Um, within that is machine learning, which are self-improving or amending sets of algorithms that change themselves based on either user input or computer input. And the difference, and then deep learning kind of in the kernel of this chart is I've heard described as machine learning that uses vast amounts of data to, to do what it does. Uh, and then we'll talk about GANs later. They kind of overlap in between there. But this is <laughs> at least the definitional, I guess, framework that I'm working with for this presentation. Still amending it, still refining it, and going to a lot of different sources. But I was surprised as a non-CS person how many different definitions of the same thing there are in computer science. But anyway, um, that being said, again, definitional challenges. Try as I might, starting this project, I could not find any term to describe what I wanted to talk about. So part of my project is going to be creating a definition for generative AI, uh, which I will, I guess, defend as an AI that automatically produces something new. Uh, in the case of my project, I'm going to be focusing on media content. Um, but I am going to be coining this term as part of my project. So, And if there is a term out there that already exists, please let me know. Uh, let me know after or some questions. Um, and I thought it would be useful to kind of talk about the difference between run-of-the-mill algorithms and machine learning, since a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you is machine learning today. Um, and my understanding is an algorithm is a fixed static set of procedures that can make infinite random iterations of a creation, in the case of generative AI, according to set procedures. Um, whereas machine learning is a fluid set of procedures that self amends or improves. And frequently, especially in the case of generative machine learning programs, they are fed, quote unquote, huge amounts of human created input to learn from and model. Um, so an example, I thought like a popular example of um, algorithmically generated media content is the popular video game Minecraft that every time the user um, interacts with and starts a new game, it algorithmically or procedurally creates a landscape for them to interact with. That algorithm is fixed. It does not really change based on user input. And it's updated by the you know, owners and developers of the game, but is otherwise pretty static. It's just a set of procedures it follows to make a landscape for the user to explore. Um, conversely, uh, one of our first generative AI I wanted to talk about is a web-based program called This Cat Does Not Exist. Um, essentially, what it does is the people who developed it fed, quote unquote, a bunch of pictures, static images of cats to the program. And then it developed its own processes and self-amended to get better and better at making fake composite cats that don't exist, hence the name. Um, and I thought it'd be fun. Yeah, we can, I can take us there right now because it's pretty fun. So every time you refresh the page, you get a new composite image of a cat. I have a cat, so I like cats, but maybe not everyone does. But it's pretty weird. Like you can tell, you know, it looks like a cat, but then sometimes it gets kind of weird on the edges because it's creating a composite cat out of different images, which is pretty fun, I think. Some of them are cute, some of them are like, ooh, yeah, that one doesn't look quite right. <laughs> I don't know, something's going on with that cat. Uh, but that's an example, I guess, of what I'm talking about with generated generative AI, that it is this machine program that is creating a cat that does not exist formerly, or an image of a cat, I guess, really. Um, let's keep it going then. I also mentioned we were gonna talk about general adversarial networks. They're a specific type of AI that um, is well, I guess a specific type of machine learning that is frequently used on in generative AI. Um, the way they work is they create a random piece of a random input vector, which 
if we're going to continue in the media discussion, let's say is a cat, right? An image of a cat. Um, the, it goes through the generator model, makes an example, and then compares it to a real cat or a real example and runs a discriminator model, which then classifies the image it created as real or fake, right? So essentially, it's continuing to learn and adapt and get better at making cats based on its ability to discriminate its own creations. Sometimes the discriminator model is human run too. Sometimes it's machine based. Um, but a really fun example is where I'll take us right now. It's kind of creepy, but kind of fun. So this is a web-based program that uses a, um, a software called This Face Does Not Exist, which similar to the cat image, AI creates a human face based on composite image of what it understands a face to be. Our job now is to determine which face we think is the real face and which face we think is the machine generated face. Our input will essentially make the machine better at its job because it learns what passes as a human face and what doesn't, right? So what face do we think is real? Left. Okay, we're right. So essentially it'll take that information and say whatever was wrong about the image on the right and whatever was right about the image on the left, it takes that information and amends itself to get better at making faces continually, right? So this is an example of human intervention, general generative adversarial networks, but I'm pretty sure we'll get one wrong if we keep going. Okay, you guys are doing great. I do worse. Are you guys just guessing, or is there some marker that tells you one's real and one's not? The, the, the real ones are all like a weird and lighting some, is also a really good. The lighting too, yeah. Like the, the right one is more of a So um, that one, I was wrong on that one. That was my gut reaction. Yeah. You guys are a good turning test. Ooh. <laughs> one more? Oh, I think it's got to be this one, right? Yeah, there's some weird stuff going on around the ear here. <laughs> oh, some disagreement? Oh, it was the right one. Okay. So what are our thoughts about this? I just want to hear if anyone has any thoughts or questions before we move on about kind of this kind of general generative adversarial networks. Maybe in the case of faces, maybe in some other case. Any thoughts or questions? I'm wondering if there's a generation divide here that the younger people in the room are identifying the fake content better mm -hmm. than some of the older people in the room. Like maybe you're more fine tuned to, you know. Yeah, that's pretty good. Some I think your intuition is not a good guide in this case because if you like, if you if you saw these for a half a second, you wouldn't be able to tell. But it's I think there's like a mnemonic that I use. Like it's there's going to be artifacting or background for like the two big ones. Right. Yeah. Like which one of those has a plausible background? And it's almost universal. I mean, and that one, like I would say the yeah, right one has a plausible background, and the left one is like yeah. not some weird, yeah. Yeah. All right, you guys are good at this. And then yeah. there's just like an intuition. Yeah, there's like a little, there's usually like a little detail mm -hmm. that like the, the network wouldn't normally put in there. It's it's still pretty uncanny though, right? Like this doesn't yeah. isn't like super like I, I think if it wasn't a lineup. You might believe that this is a real face, though, right? Sure. But the comparison makes it kind of difficult. Well, there's nothing about the face that, like, I don't like in, in my yeah. case, I don't use the face as the right. discriminator. I mean, right. It's, it's context around it. Yeah. The lighting, too. Right. Like, all of the network generated ones have, like, it, it looks like they're being lit by a studio lamp. Right. So, like, like that, that one, one looks more natural. By natural light. Right. Yeah, you guys are really good at this. You've taught me tricks I didn't know about to discern. So that's awesome. I also like what she said too. Like, there's got to be a generational disconnect because I mean, there's probably a really big reason. You could also draw like uh, similar conclusions with like how a lot of elderly click on phishing links. Right. Yeah. yeah. There are yeah. actually yeah. a lot of studies that show that. I mean, even what seems like really obvious photoshopping to a younger generation, it just goes right over right their head. head. Yeah. yeah. Grew up thinking, you know, like pictures are some reflection of reality. Exactly. Yeah, I wonder if, you know, a basic understanding of how they work too, since a lot of your CS people helps, you know, where, where if we just took blame in, you know, how they, how they would do compared to us as a sample of, you know, students and faculty interested in this. 
Um, so then we're going to start going through a brief tour of some of my favorite existing AI tools. I hope there is one that you may want to use for whatever creative or academic purposes you may have. Um, again, I'm not the most creative person, but if you want to spend more time on one that I'm going to, let me know and we can take a stop and talk about one a little more. Um, so, and I've kind of organized them by like media category, essentially. I'm still working on these groupings, um, but I want to kind of go through them based on what media we're talking about. So one, I, I like memes. I think most people sort of like memes at least. Um, there are some algorithmic programs that machine learn how to make memes. I'm not gonna take us to this meme does not exist, uh, but I'm gonna explain just from a distance it's a machine learning human content fed program, right? So it takes a bunch of memes from the internet and learns how to make memes. I don't want to guess why I don't want to take us there. Because it's making memes from the internet. Okay, so one person said it's racist, right? And why, but go, elaborate. Why, what's wrong with making memes from the internet? So much thought in our work to the, uh, the internet thinks racism is a very good cognitive point. Right, like it doesn't probably know how to discern between maybe humor that we would consider offensive and not offensive, right? What other reasons? I guess the data-driven process, um, there may tend to be like a higher level of memers that are racist. Right. And what we can do is like just to in the category. Right, I'm personally not sure what content it prioritize, prioritizes over other content. It might just be the stuff that's the most reactionary, right? Uh, I, I might guess that that's it based on the memes it makes because they're pretty, they're pretty you know, not great. Um, but there's a lot of things we don't know about it, right? Which is kind of spooky. I do, oh, I really love, Kara Swisher's like my favorite journalist ever from the New York Times. Her kind of saying about algorithms is it's garbage in, garbage out, right? What we feed these machines is essentially what they'll produce. So whatever inequities, whatever garbage, whatever racism is in the food, quote unquote, that we give these machines, well, it'll essentially replicate and maybe even augment or amplify, right? Um, depending on how the, the machine is created, right? I do have a couple funny ones. Oh yeah, you're gonna say something? Yeah, I just find this interesting because this is different from the last one with the chat because this is like supposed to induce an emotion, right? Like mm -hmm. humor. Like how do we get a machine to understand humor when like sure we can teach it to show us a picture of a cat, but then how do we teach it what's funny to a human other than feeding it a bunch of data, which sometimes doesn't make sense or isn't funny to a whole lot of other people in some contexts. Right. Yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit more about that since you brought it up. What, why do we think humor is a, a more difficult thing to code for, as an example? It's more targeted. Okay, more specific maybe to the individual. Yeah, were you going to say something too? Just the same thing, like everybody has their own sense of humor and what's funny to one person should be necessarily funny to somebody else. Right, yeah, I think that's a great point. I think also it's something that I think sometimes, at least subconsciously, I think of as uniquely human, right, <laughs> is laughing. Uh, and I think that that might be why, why it's slightly difficult. I think in my experience going through some of these and trying to find some to share, most of them kind of function more as like anti-humor than like an actual joke. It's like funny because you know an AI made it and it's like almost a joke, but not really. And that's kind of why I like them. Uh, like this one, it has a different bunch of different formats, like hard to swallow pills, you might never be a fish. I think that's kind of funny in like an anti-joke way because it's kind of absurd. Um, this one's relatable, I think. You know, which button do you press, run away, or do the right thing? I really like this one with Drake, uh, you know, not being interested in anything else, but yes, being interested in sharks, I, I like that. So it's, you know, it's not quite a joke, but it's like, there's something kind of funny there, maybe just by accident, hard to say. Um, but th there's other similar programs that do similar things with images and memes. Uh, and it's getting better, I think, but still pretty primitive. So any last thoughts on memes or do you want to keep going? All right, let's keep going then. Uh, I, I first got interested, introduced this stuff through the algorithmically generated music scene. There is, I didn't know this previously, there is a whole type of rave and dance club that uses algorithmically generated music. They call it algo rave. Pretty interesting. Is anyone on Zoom or in our audience photosensitive to flashing lights before we go on? I can skip some stuff. I'll, I'll give the chat a little bit of time to respond to that too, because I don't want to trigger anyone's 
photosensitivity. All good. Okay. Um, I really like algorithm. It's a very simple algorithmically generated music type. Every time you run the project and refresh the page, it creates a new song. Which you can laugh if you want. <laughs> some of them are good, some of them are kind of eerie, right? And then it has a music video based on your cursor. It's kind of hard to look at. But that's Algorave. That's a really primitive, simple one. That one doesn't do any machine learning. It just has a set of instructions that says, I'm going to write a new song every time based on these instructions. Uh, I really like this one. This music video does not exist as soon as. It's like not bad, right? <laughs> and it uh, that one also generates a kind of just like synesthetic image to the beat every time you use it. This one was one that was pre-uploaded that I just like uh, instead of showing you the actual tool. Um, and again, I don't think that one does any machine learning. I think it's just algorithm based, but pretty cool that it can do images too. Um, Melobytes is probably the oops, the biggest tool uh, as far as music goes. A lot of it's open source, a lot of it isn't, um, but essentially it is just a bunch of music composing tools for musicians to use that uses AI and machine learning um, technologies. So you can take text or lyrics that you wrote and have it set it to music automatically, which is pretty cool. You can have it do the opposite, give it chords and music and have it write lyrics. You can have it try to sing it to a melody it comes up with, which is pretty fun. And then you can just have it make raw music, essentially, uh, that it makes on its own, which is it's pretty fun. Oh, I had a link here. Let's see if I can find it. I might have messed it up. But there was one, uh, I think I lost it, but there was one Melobite song I really liked that I found. But it's it sounds similar to what we just heard. Some of it's weirdly reminiscent of music. Some of it's kind of more foreign, right? Um, but there's a lot of really cool tools. Some of it's behind paywalls, um, but a lot of it will give you like the actual sheet music it composes so that you can emulate it with a piano or whatever instrument you wanna use. Um, and again, some of it's like, oh yeah, that's a song. And other, other parts of it are like, well, I don't know if that's a song really by definition, but let's see. Another really cool example, this is kind of an archaic one of algorithmically generated music. So there was a program called Microsoft Songsmith, uh, which I don't believe they make anymore, that did a similar thing. It would write music algorithmically and set it to lyrics. What you could also do was give it chords and lyrics and have it assign a genre to the input that you gave it. So one really cool example that I love is they, I don't remember who did it, but someone fed Microsoft Songsmith the lyrics and chords of Billy Idol's uh, White Wedding. And it rewrote the song as a bluegrass song automatically. It just decided as an artificial intelligence that this song should be bluegrass. But let's see if I can get it to work. <laughs> but I, I kind of like it better than the original version personally. Um, and there is a uh, bluegrass band that did a cover of this version, which I thought I should share because it's again, kind of fun. Hey, let's 
sister, what have you done? Hey, little sister, who's the only one? Hey, little sister, who's your superman? Hey, little sister, who's the one you want? Hey, little sister, shotgun. It's a nice day to start again. Yeah, I, I really like this example because it's it's the it's a case of an AI deciding something and then humans taking that idea and and kind of applying it to a real life scenario. And I, I do really think it's a slap. I like that song a lot in bluegrass. I love mandolin. I'm gonna see if I can find that Melobites song I wanted to show. So I yeah, here it is. Okay, so this is Melobites website, right? Here is an example of some of the music that it generated by itself. I'm gonna try to find the part I like. And it's okay to laugh, or if you think it's a good song, you know, there's no shame in that either. Is that so right? <laughs> So like alternatively to the bluegrass song, right? There's stuff that approximates music but isn't quite on the mark, right? It's 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 like, oh yeah, I understand this functions as music, but it doesn't really sound like human music. Um and, and so that's one of the arguments I'm gonna make in my paper, probably, is that I think that this stuff functions the best with human interaction when humans can be a moderator to judge the content or even elaborate on the content. And that's what I hope we can do, you know, creatively if there's any creative text here. Does anyone want to speak to music, ask any questions, any comments or thoughts? Who likes the original versus the bluegrass? I want to know that. And who likes the bluegrass version more? It's kind of more interesting. It's more interesting, right? Yeah. Less distortion, more mandolin. I like that. Um, I've already talked about some images uh, that AI can make on its own. Uh, I think, yeah, so I think we're just going to keep moving because I talked about the cats and faces. There are AI that will create like Renaissance portraits automatically or will generate them from two different images and make composites. There's some, I really like one that does album covers by making composite images uh, of existing album covers it's fed. Um, I really like, this is kind of a newer type of these generative AI are the 3D object ones. Um, I really love this chair does not exist as David here knows. Um, I will take us there. It is essentially a generative adversarial network that creates random chairs based on what it understands a chair to be, right? And continues to learn. Uh, I'm gonna see if we can find a better one. See, that's like a pretty normal chair. You can crank up the weirdness, which I don't really know what that means, but let's see if it makes a weirder one. Yeah, that's pretty weird. But it does a pretty good job, right? And and I definitely kind of come up with that chair, right? Like it's 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 a new, it's a different type of creativity that is kind of unique. And you know, if I was some kind of furniture designer, I could see how this might be kind of inspiring or kind of interesting. I like that one a lot, actually. I printed, uh, oh yeah, the cool thing about this is you can just, whatever chair you generate and like, you can save the STL and then 3D print it, which I did with our friends over here in the 3D printing lab. I got these five chairs were kind of my favorite, printed them, they're like about that big. You can scale them however you want though. Um, I think they're pretty cute. Does anyone have a favorite out of those five? <laughs> just curious, I like the human input element of it, right? You like the second one? No, the second one. The bean bag, yeah. yeah. I like the middle one. It's like kind of Dr. Seuss, right? Yeah. But uh, I think it'd be fun. I don't know if 3D printing can like bear a load, but it'd be fun to do one full scale too and leave it here in the, in the digital matters area, I think maybe as my legacy, but I don't know if they can like, if they're like load bearing or not, but it'd be cool. I think you'd have to do it in pieces, but I'll find one I like and maybe try to print it real big. Um, another cool example of this is a, similar program that it doesn't create a 3D model, but it uses composite images and what it understands a vase to be to create vases. Um, these are all 
AI generated bases, a different kind, uh, kinds and types. Um, some of them are a little weird, but most of these are pretty good examples. They don't give you STLs, unfortunately, but still it's a cool idea. And, and part of what I want to convey is that this technology can really be applied to any type of media, uh, whether it be tangible, music, whatever you want it to be. Um, you could conceivably write uh, a generative adversarial network to emulate human creation and make something new. Uh, okay. Text and narrative is another one that's gotten pretty popular. Uh, these are actually kind of a big part of the mainstream, but one that you may have heard of is AI Dungeon. It is a, essentially a um, an AI that creates a text-based adventure for users to embark on. Um, it uses user it uses the the user input in this text-based adventure to continue learning and developing and getting better. It has come under some criticism for favoring explicit content that users choose. Um, and it's gotten into some trouble for that. So I don't want to take us there. But it's a good, it's an interesting example of how, you know, an AI can create a narrative or a story based on what it understands human stories to be. Um, social media content's another really interesting one. Uh, there is algorithmic journalism out there too, which is kind of spooky. It's essentially just an AI that will write a news story based on what it knows about it. Um, I really like subreddit simulator. It's a subreddit that is made up of AIs that learn from different subreddits on Reddit. So all the posts and comments are AI that learn from a specific subreddit. And the only human interaction on the subreddit is upvoting or sorting what content gets um, gets popular. Not going to take us there again. Pretty, you know, as you can imagine, Reddit is a diverse place with lots of perspectives, so it um, makes some some interesting AI that I will let you explore on your own. Um, I like this one that was built from the AMA subreddit, the Ask Me Anything subreddit, which claims to be Ben, Sh ben Shapiro, a conservative comedian, author, and YouTuber, which is like, eh, it's like kind of true, but not really, right? And then um, there's some some comments below from bots made from other subreddits, but essentially it's an entire social media environment occupied only by AIs that learn from human interactions, right? So I highly recommend Googling it and checking it out on your own. Again, can't uh, can't vouch for the content you will find there, but if you are cool with that, it is pretty interesting um, and a good laugh too. Uh, and then again, one I think, I, I have to mention video games because they've been doing algorithmically generated content for a lot longer than these other existing things. I already talked about Minecraft. Um, there's a really cool independent game developer collective called Prop Jam or Procedurally Generated Jam. They do a game jam, which is like independent developing uh, contests every year using procedurally generated content. Um, I really like this one. You can go to their website and they have the previous competitions. And they're doing one for 2021 as well that starts in December. Um, there's a lot of really cool games that use AI to create landscapes, environments, challenges, stories, all kinds of things. And the cool thing about them is that you can then interact with them in ways that is kind of unique to video games, right? This one's cool. This one's called Attack with Gaia. It is essentially an AI that creates a nature landscape based on different rules that you can continue to explore. And it's really pretty. It's 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 really I think it does a good job. Um, and most of those aren't machine learning based, but they're still algorithmically based. So they, they fall into that categorization of AI. Um, so if you're interested in, you know, procedural game development, I highly recommend taking a look at that. And most people who play video games are familiar with other kinds of games that use algorithms in similar ways. Um, and there's even more. And like I mentioned before, really you can apply these this technology to whatever you want as far as creating media it's not limited to the things that we've seen or really to anything um and i think that that is what makes it so interesting to study and also kind of spooky uh but fun and so with that i kind of want to take us into a discussion now based on what i've shown you and our kind of critical analysis imaginations so i want us to kind of and i'm going to open it up for discussion to everyone I want us to imagine a future 
where generative AI, the kinds of technologies I've shown you, are developed enough and popular enough that they are thoroughly immersed into mainstream digital media culture, right? So let's just imagine that. If that's the case in that future, what could go wrong? And I'm, I'm not asking you rhetorically, I'm serious. Like what kinds of things could go wrong? What do we think? We've already talked a little bit about it. Yeah. I think it would be interesting to see what they would do with like political statements because people, like everybody has their own ideas about politics and it would be interesting to see what an AI would do taking in all those opinions and trying to maybe form something with that. Yeah, I think uh, to add to that, there's definitely interesting implications as far as information in our media environments, right? Especially when these are programs that are designed kind of to deceive us. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's spooky to think about possible political or informational implications of these AI, yeah. Is generative AI, does that include like deep fakes? Yeah. Because I mean, you could probably think what could go wrong with deep fakes. Right. Yeah, I think those are tricky, right? Because it uses AI technology to do what the user wants to do to the video, right? So it's not necessarily creating something randomly, uh, but it does. Yeah, I, I thought about talking about deep fakes. I haven't really gotten to it in my research yet because it could probably be a project in of itself. That is a really good point. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. You touched on this a bit, but of course, like there are concerns around algorithmic bias. Mm -hmm. We treat technology as if it's neutral, but all the data going into it might be biased in particular ways that, you know, are even more devastating because we think that the thing coming out is neutral when in reality it like reflects all the worst sometimes of what humans already bring to the table. Right. And I guess um, with that being said, what if we understand that a lot of these programs learn from the internet? What kind of media might that prioritize it learning from? Divisive, polarized, outraged. <laughs> right. Yeah. What else? Um, but probably generally stuff that's just like um, consumerist and sort of addictive to look at. Right. Stuff that has a commercial bias, maybe. Yeah. So that's that's what I imagine could go wrong. Is like. We already like I'm I myself am like pretty addicted to like YouTube because of that stupid algorithm because it right. just keeps giving you the best videos. That algorithm knows, yeah, yeah, it, right. it knows it knows me better videos, than I know myself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. With, a, with a funny title. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So like, and then you're three hours. Like if, if AI could like not just recommend videos but like generate videos, like man, I would be hooked like so intensely. Totally. It would be so bad. Yeah, so a great point I was going to bring up. Yeah. But this is already kind of happening with like children's videos, right? Yeah. Where yeah. AI is yeah. able to create and you know, distribute. If yeah. it's able to do that for adults, then we're all going to be toddlers on our tablets. Right. Yeah. It's screenagers, right? Yeah. I, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I think that's a great point. There's already so much good discussion about how like TikTok knows us better than we know ourselves and knows that we're going to like, right? But if it could also make content for us, it's that's an interesting way to think. That's It's spooky to think about, right? Um, I, I think one point I wanted to bring up before we get into some other questions is not all good content is on the internet, right? Like there, there is internet and digital communication is a privilege that not everyone globally um, enjoys. So it obviously only produce content based on content that's on the internet, which is going to leave out some people, right? Um, let's see what other questions like. Yeah, what would our media environment look like? We've already touched on this, but what would our digital media diet look like if these things were in the mainstream? I think um, kind of what's already happening, if you look at something like social media, where we're less and less connected to the origin of the content we're looking at like your feed is less of the people you've deliberately followed and more of what the machine knows you'll like that will proliferate so we'll be um we'll understand less and less of like broad histories or stories of where something originates from and um 
you know, we'll, we'll be more connected to the immediacy and like instant gratification media than like um, following along with creators and seeing how their work grows over periods of time and that kind of thing. Right, there's issues of authorship, right? Yeah. Like um, who is the author of, or who is the owner, let's say, of a media generated story? Is it the people who write media? I mean, is it the people who write the algorithm, excuse me? Or is it the algorithm itself, right? And, uh, or is it the things that the algorithm learned from, right? Uh, which, because essentially what they're doing most of the time is a kind of remix, right, from human generated content. Uh, there's some really interesting people who talk about this kind of Ouroboros too, of machine generated media influencing future machine learning media creation, right? In that they will eventually learn from their own creations, which is kind of crazy to think about too. Any other you're, thoughts? Yeah. You're generating uh, a product by feeding it you know, material from the source. It seems like it would uh, veer towards homogeneity and mediocrity, right? Because you're just averaging out all this content uh, that's already out there. And so that leads me to sort of a pressing question I had during your presentation. Is I was wondering, there's no point in your presentation you talk about creativity, right? Or defining creativity. I kind of cataloged all of these AI tools, but I'm really interested in hearing from you, like, well, you know, is this creative? Like, uh, does, does human intervention have to be part of the mix for it to be creative, or can an AI tool can't be created by itself? Yeah, no, it's definitely um, something I wanted to talk about. Um, I think, yeah, I was gonna pose the question, is AI creativity as valid or valuable as human creativity? What is what is the whole group thing? Well, I mean, like uh, the thing I kept thinking about was Photoshop mm. in the early days, back in the nineties. You know, uh, people who weren't familiar with Photoshop saw what you could do with a picture with a filter. They thought, "Wow, this is really fascinating! It's so cool! It's so creative!" Mm -hmm. Because they didn't really understand how it works. They, right. they didn't know any better, right? Um, and but you know, now that we're familiar with the tool understand how exactly how it operates you understand there's no creativity there it's just right like an algorithm right so i'm wondering is it just a matter of generational familiarity right You're right uh are we do we think um the algorithm jukebox is creative because we just don't it's new right or you know is there some other criterion that we need to use to be universal in judging what it, whether it's something that's creative totally i think um that point, I think something that at least I think of as uniquely human is creativity, right? Personally, I uh, and so it, it, I think it's easy to get defensive about um, creativity as something that only humans can do, right? But what other thoughts do we have in response to this question? Yeah. I guess we have to define really like what creativity means. Like, how how can we compare like? If human creativity is better, what makes human creativity better than AI creativity? Like, like, I, like how do we like I guess quantify what makes good creativity, right? Right. So that's just a question. I guess it's not really an answer. To that. No, that's I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Any other thoughts? I mean, I, I'm hesitant to say this because it's not something I've thought about a lot, but it does seem like a lot of the creative works that I value are things that elicit some kind of human emotion inside of me, like feeling, you know. That the, the person who created it understood loneliness or feeling, you know, um, love. And the fact that something created it that also doesn't share those feelings of like the human emotions of loneliness or love or being forlorn or whatever, it it devalues it in my mind. It doesn't right. give me that connection with the creator. So for me, it feels less valuable, but I might change over time if this becomes more common. No, I think it's a great point. I think like that's one way to evaluate valuable creativity is its, its ability to be expressive, right, or to communicate complex ideas. And that does beg the question, if, if AI don't have emotions, can they express emotions? Would it just be accidental? Um, is it less meaningful? Yeah, super interesting questions that way, too. Yeah. So I think a lot of people think, say that like art is completely, like a value of a piece of art is, you know, highly Objective, but I think there is some objectivity in it in terms of like how difficult it was to produce. Um, 
you know, and maybe the difficulty isn't the person's talent. Um, so it's very difficult to produce, requires a lot of training or labor, and therefore it's highly priced and there's not many like replicas you can get. Um, but, you know, maybe with AI as it gets better uh, at producing content, the like threshold of labor talent goes down. Mm -hmm. And so it makes a lot of common media like less valuable. Cool. It, like a simple example would be that um, images or like pictures to like hang up on the wall have decreased in value generally just because it's so much cheaper to make them and so much more people have access to photography uh, to where you know you buy a, a picture and it, it's it's not it doesn't mean as much as it used to just because it was harder to produce. So I think there could be a potential for a lot of media to decrease in value. And so there's going to be maybe like a race of authenticity to be like, did this take a long time? How can I verify that this person like produced something that you can't just produce on your own? Right. Nobody wants to pay for something that they can do themselves. So if I can use an AI and you can use an AI, why would I buy something like a piece of art from you? You have to prove to me that it's unique and hard to make. Right. Yeah. There's this kind of inflation aspect to it, right? That I, I worry about what it would do to our taste in media. Um, like someone brought up the AI generated children's content. Like it's not, I wouldn't call it good. You know what I mean? Like, and if all we're watching or consuming is is AI generated stuff, I, I can see how that might make us all have bad taste in media. Um, I think your 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 comment also made me think that it's it's interesting that if we take melobytes as an example, each composition it makes is is by definition unique right. in that it's never been made before, right? But at the same time, is by definition derivative in that it was created by existing human creation, right? So it's simultaneously unique and completely derivative in that it was made by a process and 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 as and from examples, right? Yeah, thanks for that. I think it's very revealing the examples that you've used that have carried weight with us involve like an embrace of some, you know, AI generated something, but with like the piece of human curation or like the remix of it, you know, when a real bluegrass band is covering what, what you showed us, you know, like, um, or even just the way you chose which of the shares that don't exist were compelling to you like we learned something about you through that so it becomes interesting or meaningful so i'm not even sure that we do need to prove like a difficulty in producing something or uniqueness but we there does seem to be at least for now a necessary element of um the curation or like the selection of something that was very easy to produce into another work where it takes on another life because there's sort of there's still like a human infused element in it. Yeah, I I I, I and that's I really like to ask people like which of these do you like the yeah. best because I think that's an interesting way to think about it, right? And a lot of people in the writing I've seen do posit that the solution to some of the problems we've identified is human moderation, um, and that's the way, especially you know when you consider that AI doesn't really have a sense of morality as we understand it, at least yet, um, it's it's good to have a human intervening who, who hopefully does. Um, yeah. Yeah, and the way you brought up the, the camera, I think is a, a good example, because I think it could become like the camera and the way we see it as a tool. And um, it's ultimately like a lens for the human creativity to like travel through rather than anything that's like a, a, a means to its own ends. Yeah, we don't consider the camera the creator of the picture, right? Um, and I, I think, you know, AI probably blurs that line a little bit, but yeah, that's a great point. Um, I, I think an interesting question to ask ourselves is could AI get better at creativity than we currently are, right? What if it makes better television, you know, better music, more comp more expressive art? Um, that's that's an interesting feature to think about. I was just thinking that that's sort of what complicates the first question is that we currently know that it doesn't make art as well as we do. Like we know AI could probably make like a Hallmark movie, you right. know, but it couldn't make Citizen Kane. Right. But that is such a good question of what happens when it does surpass us, which I think is reasonable to think that it could. Yeah. Um, 
I, I wanted to go back to a previous question I didn't mention. Um, and, and this is connected to the digital matters theme, but how might generative AI be a threat to sustainability, especially digital sustainability? I think it's also like access and who has access to uh, the algorithms, uh, the institutions to like the algorithms and or uh, the testing tools for access space. I think I think that's a question or that's that's a thought that kind of Jones up for me currently is like going into these institutions. I think that a lot of people are using uh, peers and algorithms don't use more cloud people call it and right. other uh, because of the lab or in like the research group that they worked on. You know, like there are people of color. Right. Uh, so I think that's kind of like a larger question is, you know, because of that uh, inequity you mentioned it earlier, where it's like um, a lot of good, good content's not online, right? And usually it's because not everyone has access to it. And yeah, like, so because this reflects on how, um, you know, who, who has access to oh, right. online, which usually is kind of the other class. And I feel like that widening gap right now because, because it is a Yeah, that's. Awesome. I think to your point, another solution to the problems we've identified that people suggest is just to have to emphasize marginal people of marginalized identities creating these softwares, right? Um, that's another solution that people posit. All right, one thing I, I think of the kind of colloquial phrase, I don't know how true it is, that humans upload more YouTube content per day than conceivably watched by be watched by all humanity, right? Uh, and my thinking is if we already create that much content as humans, if we amplify that, if we add machines to the mix and doing it automatically, that the amount of content could conceivably be so large that it is unstorable because uh, there is, you know, a physicality to data storage, right? Maybe it drives the prices up of the internet um, or maybe it just, you know, maybe we just can't store them, period, uh, or just makes it more expensive too. Um, yeah, we'll skip that one. Um, another thing I think I kind of want to close with, and, and this is kind of going back to the creativity question, uh, I think it's important for us to think about our relationship to these AI as human. Um, I plan, I am not a person of indigenous heritage, but there has been really good critical indigenous writing about human, non-human AI relationships. Um, my my kind of my favorite one is that you know western epistemologies kind of think that whatever human creates we are dominant over it is a resource to be exploited um and a lot of cool indigenous based arguments contend that um really it should be a relationship of give and take or equality uh or, or at least of responsibility as opposed to commerciality um and i i think yeah, if I was going to conclude my thoughts on it, I think that we need to be thinking critically about these these technologies at the same rate that we are creating them, at very least. If not, um, you know, I, I just think that we need to be talking about these questions uh, in the spaces that these technologies are being created. Otherwise, they will outpace our ability to, you know, interact with them safely and, and equitably. Um, and that's kind of my, my final point. And I'd love to open it up. We're, we're running pretty low on time, but I'd love to open up to questions from Zoom or from people here from me, or just something you want to bring up to have other people answer whatever you like. Yeah. I guess I just had a thought you were, at the end there, you were mentioning uh, what kind of like relationship we should have with AI. And I guess at this point, like in all aspects, like uh, with, uh, data storage and everything like computers are like just superior, right? Like they can like calculate things much faster than any human, right? So I guess the question is like, is it inevitable if say an AI program is superior, has superior hardware, right? Then is it possible to even have an equal relationship, right? Like, and if so, then it would it be necessary for to secure equality to have, I guess, chains of limitations on the AI. Right. What, what those limitations be, I guess, right? Are they accountable, you know, for what they make? Um, I think another thing to add to that is, is even in the, the name artificial intelligence, I think the term artificial has a connotation, a kind of negative connotation, right? Artificiality isn't something that we really 
value as humans, at least in the Western world. Um, so I think that there's some like we have we have I don't want to compare AI to to humans who who are, are marginalized, but we do have some implicit assumptions we make about AI uh, that may or may not be true now or in the future, right? Um, and I think just assuming that they are inferior to us or evaluating them that way might not be the best way to design them, right? Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah. It's kind of interesting thinking about this uh, algorithm produced uh, media content, right? Like, but what are, what be the goal of this type of content, right? Because you can't monetize it all. Like, for example, on Instagram, you can make an AI, AI just generate Instagram posts, but then it's like, what would the goal be? Like, creating the AI in the first place. Like, what's the human drive behind that? I suppose you could monetize it, or you could perhaps put in a political bias. Or put like your own personal spin into the AI to promote your own personal ideas. Yeah, so, I don't know. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a really good point because I think in most of the tools I've I've included, as far as like why they made it, it's just like a proof of concept or yeah. because we could or we thought it was interesting, yeah. which is weird when you're thinking about like creating an intelligence, right? In a in, in kind of a definitional sense, it's a weird motivation to make something that can make things, right? It's just because we can. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. We have a Zoom question from Kevin. Is your understanding of generative AI essentially the same as GAN's, except that the latter has a discrimination function via human or machine, but the former doesn't necessarily have that? Yeah, I would say that um, generative AI don't need to be GAN's, but all GAN's are generative AI, if that makes sense. Um, so it's like concentric circles again. And then again, let's see. I want to make sure I get all the questions. So yeah, there, I mentioned types of generative AI that are not GANs and don't have a discriminating function um, that just follow a set of procedures and make something without being evaluated subsequently. So yeah, I guess, yeah, I would, I would probably say that all GANs are generative AI, but not the inverse, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Any other questions? No more questions. Please thank you. <laughs>